Okay, so Dilraj, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Lovely to have you here with us today. And what a day it is. It's my first first podcast of the year in shorts. So uh, you've got that <laughs> accolade. <laughs> but uh, Dilraj, really great to see you. Um, by way of introduction, that you are the head of data and analytics for Brompton. Um, obviously a very well-known uh, bike manufacturer, or well, certainly if you live in any major city. I think most people are aware of Bromptons and have seen them a lot. I, I always look at them as a, an unbelievable feat of engineering when I see one of those and like, how it gets into that sort of uh, you know, position. But, um, but yeah, prior to uh, Brompton, you've had a very illustrious career in, in other areas of data leadership. So you've performed senior positions for uh, the likes of uh, GSK as well, so another uh, another huge brand. So, uh, yeah, you're clearly bringing a, a real wealth of experience uh, with you today, and I'm super keen to hear more about your uh, your approach as a data leader. Thanks again for, for being here with us. So before we, uh, we, we, we crack into that and start talking a bit, a bit more about the work you're doing at, at Brompton, it'd be great just to hear a little bit more about the start of your journey from the beginning, um, how you arrived into tech and, and data, and, and ultimately how you got into the position that you're uh, you're in today. Yeah, absolutely. Again, thank you for having me. Um, it's going to sound like a little bit of a cliche, uh, and a lot of people talk about this you know, on TED Talks and YouTube videos, but there's been a lot of failures in my career. There's been a lot of rejections, a lot of no's from a lot of people, and quite often it's been um, a career of resilience so far, a career of more hard work than I thought it would be, and it seems to be really paying off. So nice. um, I was studying maths at Brunel University. Uh, still really good friends with lots of people who are from there, which is fantastic. And I did a placement year, which um, often people don't talk about in their careers, but I'm going to because there's a link to what happens afterwards. Cool. Um, so I was working for the Department of Health. I moved up to Leeds, absolutely loved living there. Also part of the NHS uh, England when that first came around as well. So spent, spent a year living there. Get out of my comfort zone. Go to New Horizons. I went to university in London, born and raised in London. Let's go do something different. It was my mum that pushed me. I remember it so well. I was really reluctant to leave London. And she said, if you don't go, I'm going to pack your bags for you and send you in an Uber to leave. And I thought, <laughs> Thanks, that, that sounds expensive. I'll just book a train. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, moved to Leeds for a year uh, and loved it and came back down. Um, didn't really enjoy working in the civil service, but I had a bug working in healthcare. So I made sure that when I was doing my final year that I was picking a dissertation that was related to um, medicine or drug development or drug discovery. And that's how I ended up at GSK. But even when I ended up at GSK and, and got my role there, throughout the interview process, I must have got rejected about three times throughout the interview process <laughs> in each of the stages. And I just and they just kept coming back again and again and saying, oh, no, we'll do the interview now, we'll do the interview. And I didn't realise that until I got to the final interview, the issue was was that they didn't have enough people to th put through each stage. Oh, okay. So when I got to my final stage interview, I was there with a group of people who were on the finance graduate scheme, but they thought, oh, we'll just move them over to the statistics graduate scheme. And I thought to myself, I'm in here. I'm in here. I, I can beat these people. I, I can get this job. And it was grueling, you know. I've had a lot of interviews in my life. I've moved into a lot of roles. I, I've had eight different roles in, in my career, um, in, in my short career, I should say as well, that, just to uh, give that context. And that was probably the most difficult interview that I ever had. And it was a day and a half of interviewing. That wow. was tough, yeah. Um, but you got the whole GSK experience. They take you to the top floor and, and they show you everything. It was, yeah. it was brilliant, nice. absolutely fantastic. They really sell you on it. So I spent the first three years working as a statistician across manufacturing, across R&D. Really enjoyed it, had a great time. Um, but what was strange about joining was that they hadn't had a statistician on the graduate program for 12 years. Really? Um, they hadn't really had a, a graduate program for statisticians. They had people who were coming in direct entry from university. Right. So they didn't really know what to do with me. And I could have chosen at that point to go, they don't know what to do with me in panic. But I thought, they don't know what to do with me. I can do what I want. And, and this was fantastic. <laughs> it was freedom. So I sort of uh, chose my own path. And, and the idea was to go from one manufacturing site to the next manufacturing site to the next one. And I saw the kind of work that they were doing at these different sites. And it was the same thing. Different products, but same statistical methodology, same tools, same analysis. And I thought to myself, hey, I'm in a really early part of my career. 
I see statisticians generally don't move roles a lot. There's a lot of people who have been in their roles for 8, 10, 12, 15 years. If I'm going to be a statistician, this is a chance to go and do something different. Mm. And that's why I did move to R&D and then came back to manufacturing. But again, when I was in manufacturing, I um, I, I didn't work on the site. I work in a global team, right. which was um, great exposure in that sense. I remember my manager was based in America. His manager was based in Ireland. So I spent a lot of time in America, Ireland, Newcastle, America, Ireland, Newcastle. Mm. Uh, for about eight months, it was quite exhausting. And throughout all of this, I was doing my master's part-time as well. Wow. Um, that's worth mentioning, yeah. So um, I've seen my master's with Sheffield University, everything on YouTube. I graduated right before COVID. So Sheffield were ahead of the game in terms of how to uh, run a master's virtually. Absolutely. So imagine all the, all the on-premises students uh, had to eventually do all of their lectures on YouTube as well. Um, I was doing a COVID master's pre-COVID, which was very interesting. Good on you. It was great. Yeah, I managed to to do it over three years while working and had some really supportive managers as well. Brilliant. Got to the end end of my graduate program and I just wanted more. I wanted to do something different. I didn't want to stay in manufacturing and it wasn't that I didn't enjoy it. I just thought that I can go and do something different and, and, and explore different parts of being someone who not is necessarily a statistician, but knows how to do things with data. Uh, Mm. Quite simply that I can do stuff with data. Does that mean I need to be a statistician? I can go and explore uh, different roles. Um, And I was in our headquarters and I uh, met one of the ladies who runs the talent program. And she said, oh, HR, I've got a data team. And I went, excuse me? She said, yeah, HR, I've got a data team. There's this new thing called people analytics quote-unquote new it's not a new discipline it's a relatively new compared to other disciplines and I just started exploring it I I met up with them once a month every single time I came down and and this is also a lesson in networking when when you meet people when you network with leaders and you meet them once you haven't built a connection leaders meet people like you all the time Mm. every single day you need to continually make an impression on them yeah and i must have met them about seven or eight times and of course they were working in 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 hr analytics and hr data so they could only show me so much Mm. but i remember when it came to the interview i must have had about 15 20 minute interview and got the job and i absolutely loved it i had a brilliant time there And, and what happened with that job it was probably the one that changed my career in terms of the path that I was going on because I was hell-bent on being a statistician for a really, really long time. Mm. You know, you get into this mindset that you know what you're going to do for the rest of your career. And it was a lesson to me to never prescribe what my career is, which is why when I'm in interviews and people ask me, what's your five-year plan? I say, well, five years ago, I didn't know I was going to be here. So how can I plan for something that I don't know what's going to happen? You're essentially asking me, you know, you're a psychic, tell me yeah. what's going to happen. So yeah. I don't plan, have a five-year plan. I have a five-year direction. Mm. I don't have a five-year plan. Important distinction. Very important distinction. Um, and something that I would always advise people who do have five, 10, sometimes 15-year plans. It, mm. it never works like that because there's always factors that are outside of your control that would change the course of your mm. career, um, which I'll go on to once I, once I left GSK. So I did that role for 20 months, but that role was split into two. Uh, The area was getting a lot of investment, and it very much started off being an analyst role. And halfway through the role, the team expanded, and the analysts in the teams essentially became consultants aligned to different parts of the business. And I was aligned to the vaccines part of the business. Now, if people don't know about GSK's vaccines business, it's based predominantly in Belgium. And it's the biggest manufacturing site in the world in any industry. Um, I think it's the size of 20 football pitches. And you need bicycles to go around the site. So, you know, it's it's as big as the the eye can see. Mm. Um, Amazing spending time there internationally. Uh, But the way the role changed was that I was now presenting data to quite senior leaders. And I started to develop what I call data storytelling. So where does the data come from? How do we turn it into insights? How is it aligned to the wider picture of what the business is trying to do? Mm. And what should the business do a, a, as, a, as a result of those insights, which is really where the direction that data needs to go into. And I realized I've got a knack for this. I'm good at analyzing data, but I'm better at talking about data and talking to senior leaders about data. There was a 
there was a fearlessness that I had at that age that that started to go a little bit and it started to come back again, which is which is great. It's a good feeling. Um, and I realized I was very good at this. Um, and I thought to myself, hey, I need to go into a role where I'm doing this all the time, right? Into this sort of partnering storytelling role. And I'd been in that team coming up to two years and I thought, why don't I just go online and see what's out there? Went onto the internal platform, first job that came up on that platform, commercial insight partner. And I thought, oh, that sounds like something I want to do. And I applied for the job and I got it. And I was really, really fortunate in that sense. But my gosh, this was an extremely difficult job for many reasons. Um, I joined a respiratory environment in March 2020, which, if you don't know, was the beginning of a respiratory pandemic. Yeah, so from course, a data yeah. point of view, this was th this was crazy. It mm. was really difficult trying to figure out what was going on. Mm. And because my role was around business partnering and connecting what the data strategy is to the commercial strategy, I had to try and get my head around some very complicated data sets very quickly mm. without necessarily having the data team around me to help answer some of those questions. Sure. So most of my role was around working with stakeholders, understanding what they need, tra translating what they need to what, da what data people need. And I never called it a partner role. Some people used to call it influencer. I hated that word. The word I called was diplomat. And we'll talk about this more later. Because quite often when you're working with data teams and when you're working with non-data teams, they speak completely different languages. Very true. And in these roles, you need to essentially speak two languages, quite similarly to how diplomats between countries, political parties would yeah. be. You know, you have someone in England and you have someone in France, they speak English, they speak French, and they're able to translate in between the two and create relationships, essentially. That's yeah. what they're doing. That's exactly what I was doing. I was creating relationships between data teams mm. and non-data teams. So it's a nice description of it, actually. I've never heard the diplomat, diplomat phrase before, yeah. but I'll, uh, I'll, I'll tell you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and where that really bore itself was that the data teams needed to understand more about what the non-data team were talking about, understanding the language. Yeah. And the non-data teams need to understand the language of the data teams. Not all of it. But you need to have a little bit of understanding. My job was to translate the, the diplomat. Um, one day I would employ my own data diplomat. I'll, I've <laughs> never seen that job on LinkedIn jobs I before. I haven't. I would love to recruit for one of these. Yeah, that, that would be my first one. Really, really enjoyed that work. But it was tough. It was really tough. And as a business partner, starting in a, in a COVID environment where you don't meet people face to face um, and you're trying to build relationships is really, really difficult. Mm. And what it taught me uh, and what I realized was that I needed to find a way to express myself better over a camera. It's absolutely fine doing it in person. There's a way you build relationships with people. It's the reason why we ask people to come to the office because there's a, there's a way you build relationships with people that you can't over camera. Yeah. But I never had to learn how to build relationships over camera because all of my jobs at that point were in the office all the time, yeah. five days a week. This was pre-COVID. This was when this whole hybrid idea was, wasn't really um, here. This idea of if you wanted to work from home one day, you'd had to tell your line manager, hey, I'm working from home this day. Mm. That's not the case anymore. We've changed so much in, what, four years? Mm. So I had to find a way to build relationships over camera, and it completely changed the way, the way that I, I worked. But in a way, it, it forced me to do something which was going to become part of the new normal. It, it, it was just the case. Um, and I absolutely loved that job. And it sounds like a cliche, but when I left that job, I said to them, I joined this job as a boy and I left this job as a man. And what I meant by that was that I knew that there were so many hurdles I overcame in that job that whenever something comes up in my career now, anything that I'm nervous about, if it's talking to a, a chief commercial officer or a chief operational officer, I always go back to that job and I go, Dorage, you did that, you can do anything. Um, and I loved that job and I was really good at it. And that's why I left. <laughs> I was in my comfort zone. I wanted to do something different. So my last role at GSK, um, I took a job as initially what was the data science director in the digital and tech team. Um, and it was a secondment. I took a one-way secondment. 
um, which meant that if I didn't have a job at the end of my current role, then uh, I would take redundancy. And that was never something that I ever thought about. I thought, oh, I'll find a job afterwards, no problem. You know, you know, it's GSK, they're not going to let me go. They've invested so much in me. I was in this bubble. I was in this career plan of mine. I'll be at GSK for a really long time. And I really enjoyed the job. I met some fantastic people, some of who I'll talk about in, in this podcast and, and some of the things that they taught me. Um, but I just got a disconnect. I, I, I started to feel a disconnect, not necessarily from the company, but from from the kind of work that I wanted to be doing. And when around this time last year, where when I got offered my redundancy package, you know, I had just turned 30, and I thought, I'm in a point in my life where um, I'm financially stable, I don't have any children, I'm not getting married anytime soon. I thought, if I'm never going to take a career break, when am I going to take it? And, and that was the time for me, it, mm. it was. Um, and so I left in September last year, and I didn't seriously start looking for a job until January. Mm. Um, I needed a break, and I took a long break, and um, I travelled. I, I just travelled a lot. I think I travelled from the start of September till about the middle of November, and it was just a, a huge sort of... If I describe it as an elastic band, once I left at the end of GSK, it, that band was about to snap. Mm. When I stopped travelling, the band was just thankful that I let go of it in that yeah, sense yeah, yeah. and it was just the relief and I, I properly started looking for jobs in January and um, yeah I ended up at Brompton I started working at Brompton in, in April absolutely loved working there had a very interesting interview process where I was in the middle of the mountains in Philippines talking to a bunch of people interviewing me who could all see each other in teams and I was on a five second delay on my phone trying to get Wi-Fi. Oh. I had a very colorful interview process. Uh, didn't meet them until the final stage, but yeah, I've been there for just over two months now. It's a new experience. Obviously I've gone from a, a huge uh, sort of corporate organization to a family owned business. But um, on Saturday, just gone, uh, was the Brompton World Championships and uh, which I always end up in London. Um, and obviously I'm working for a British company again. And I've, I've just started to realize just how cool of an organization I work for. And there's a sense of pride I get every time. Even on the way here from the train station, I saw someone with their, with their um, blue Brompton. So so uh, easy to recognize. And yeah. I just thought, oh, this is a really cool company. So yeah, really enjoying it. And, um, you know, probably still in the honeymoon period where I'm, I'm very resilient. I'm just get on with everything. Uh, but... Definitely been thrown into the deep end, but yeah, really, really enjoying it. And I've got a fantastic team as well um, and an opportunity to do some great things at a great company. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, thank you for that. And um, so many great points that you made there um, whilst you were talking. Uh, I think the one that really resonates with me is the fact you started from a place of, you know, recognising not, not failure, but rejection and actually how you need to be resilient and how that's a really underrated skill I believe in, in business and in life in general really and I totally agree with you on your point as well around um, you know developing relationships with people relationships are an organic thing that you've really got to work at and you know they don't sort of stay in homeostasis for, for long and you can't expect to meet somebody once and then be your best friend and it is about really putting the effort in putting the time in and, and kind of really working getting face time with people um, which is which is really why you know, we do the job in the way we do the job really it is you know it's, it's I, I prefer spending time with people face to face in all honesty rather than over a screen but it, I think it's one of the best ways to really get to know somebody and really build that relationship and uh, I think you can never sort of es escape that from a human psychology point of view you know people are, um, are looking to advance their careers it is about getting around the right people and spending time with them and, and like you say you get into a nice situation where you end up having a 15 20 minute long interview because you've kind of been interviewing for the whole you exactly. know, seven or eight times you've been you've been meeting. That's them, where so, they were. Yeah. They were, they were yeah. soft interviews in themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that's a great point that you, you make there. Um, and um, so yeah, talk talk. And what, the other thing I'll ask, I'll say before asking the next question is really impressed with how you know you you've been that sort of catalyst in your own career when you sort of felt like you're in that comfort zone to just continue to challenge yourself. And I think I really respect that kind of mindset because. You know, um, comfort is the enemy of, of, of progress, isn't it? And um, yeah, in fact, you've kind of 
recognize that sometimes and proactively done something to change the situation I, I really respect that as well so um it'd be lovely to hear a bit more about what you've gathered from your career to date you've mentioned you've worked alongside some great data leaders and sort of taken um you know, some of their approach uh, on board to sort of shape your your data leadership but um yeah talk, talk me through from your perspective what are the qualities of a, of a good data leader do you feel yeah, I think sometimes we we look at the qualities of a good data leader as something very specific and distant from what are the qualities of a good leader. And we live in a day and age now where there's a lot of people in the world mm. publicly and within our company who are, who are terrible leaders. Um, and I'm an observer. I'm a people watcher. I, I watch people from a leadership point of view. And I listen to people's opinions who I respect as well. And most importantly, I don't listen to people's opinions who I don't respect. And I don't take advice on people who I wouldn't ask advice from. So, mm. And I think that's important because we, we also live in a day and age where everyone's got an opinion about everything. And Very true. Yeah, a lot of our opinions are, are shaped on other people's opinions and, and not based on any knowledge that we've got on our own. So I'm really careful about, you know, this is my opinion of what a good data leader is. Uh, I think that the, the most important thing for me as a data leader is someone who's able to recognize how the work that their team are doing is linked to the bigger picture. And quite often what happens with data teams is that they're working on a particular project, a particular report, a particular engineering strategy, a particular data science model, for example, and they're not clear on the why. Why are we doing this? So why are we building a forecast to predict what's happening in the future? Why do we need to predict what's happening in the future? Do, do you see what I mean? And, and there's not that link between often what data teams are doing and what the, and what the bigger picture is. Yeah. And in my experience, particularly in that role in, in respiratory as the commercial insight diplomat, I'm calling it now, <laughs> um, it was a, a lot of the work that we did in the team was so brilliant and we were able to churn some things out so quickly because we connected to the why. And I understood what the commercial organization needed. Mm. And I remember there were some projects that we did in about, I remember there was one project we did in, on segmentation of, of uh, doctors and nurses, 100,000 doctors and nurses in the, in the UK in primary care. And we built a, a segmentation model in 10 weeks from start to finish from getting the requirements, getting the data, doing the model, getting it out to the sales reps, getting them to do their their plans and getting them out on the road wow. in 10 weeks. And I, I think our, our SVP wanted to go out to an external partner. I said, no, we're doing this internally. Just give me a few months and we're going to get it done. Because the team were connected to the why. They mm. understood. And I think the, ne the next bit around being a great data leader is about protection yeah. as well. And Sometimes I, I've, I don't, I, I've been on both sides. I've been in data teams where I haven't heard a lot of the noise that's coming from organizations in terms of what they want data teams to do. Mm. In my role now, the amount of noise that comes into the data team in terms of can we do X, can we do Y, can we do Z, the team will be exposed to 20% of that. Yeah. And... I act as a, a filtration to around, this is going to come through, this passes through a durage and this comes into the team and we're going to work on this. This doesn't pass through because you're not clear on your ask and I've got a hundred questions for you. <laughs> Mainly about, you know, what are you actually asking here? But secondly, hey, I'm relatively new. I don't actually understand why we're doing this. And holding others to account around, right, I'm going to make sure my team are working on things that align to the strategy, to the overall strategy of this organization. Is what you're asking us to do aligned to the overall strategy of the organization? And we'll talk about partnering and, and, and how we work with stakeholders more, I'm sure. Yeah. So I think that's really important as well. I think the third thing, and um, it will be evident from the width of roles that I've done in my career, is that there's a lot of people who don't come from data backgrounds who are progressing with their career vertically and then horizontally move into data leadership roles. So, for example, I might see people come through 
uh, and this is no offence to anyone who works in procurement, but someone who might come through as a procurement director, and then they start looking at procurement analytics in procurement, and then they move into data analytics, and then they move to data analytics and AI. And it's like, oh, okay, fine. But if you've got some really technical ma machine learning engineers in their team, are you in a position to support them, not just from a people point of view, but from mm. a technical point of view as well? Yeah. And some leaders who have come from that background don't have the ability to do that. And they don't understand that they end up creating a disconnect with their team. I make sure that my team know in any circumstance I'm ready to get my hands dirty with them. I don't want to feel like that there's a distance or that I think I'm above getting my hands dirty with some of this stuff. I'm very happy to. And in fact, one of the reasons why I didn't enjoy my last role so much is because I didn't get to do any of that. Okay. I, I couldn't get my hands dirty with anything. And when I started at Brompton, I opened an Excel spreadsheet and I thought, how do I use this again? <laughs> because it had been a while since I've gone into Excel and started <laughs> yeah. doing some things or been a while since I coded in SQL or did something in R. But it was just, I, I, I realized I was out of practice because I separated myself. And it it's possible that my career will go in a direction where I just won't have the time to do that. But where I am now is at a point where I'm, leading people who are very technical and I'm not going to truly get them aligned with the why and be able to help them if I don't know what to do from a technical point of view. Yeah. So so still having that background and that grounding, you know, I went to a, went to a Databricks certification day last week to get up to speed. Everyone in that room was technical mm. and I thought, where are their managers? Or have their managers come to this? I hope they have. I, mm. I hope they realise how important it is. So creating that relationship because... No matter what area you work in, people buy into people, mm. no matter what the work is. And the most important thing is that if my, if the people in my team feel like as if they actually want to work for me and the, and the work is interesting, I'm investing in what they're doing, they'll work. Otherwise, mm. they won't. They won't. And, yeah. Or they'll just be less productive. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And it works both ways, doesn't it? I think people know that. I, re I really like that point you mentioned about the... Uh, being the protective of your team and making sure it aligns with the business uh, for the greater good of them, I guess, but for also for the greater good of the business. But I think teams recognise that about leaders when you know they are protecting them from the business in, in, in the right way and, and that sort of fosters loyalty and uh, ultimately stronger retention. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of great points there around data leadership that I 100% agree with. Um, Talk us through, and, and uh, yeah, I think we will go into that uh, data partnership, partnering with the business um, more in a moment. But before we do, just interested to understand from your experience so far, how would you look to structure uh, a data team or department um, for success within a business? Is Do you look at it on a case-by-case -case basis or do you see it as any good company should have this sort of coherent strategy around data and this should be the structure of the team to execute on that. How, how do you uh, feel about that? Yeah, I think there's there's a multitude of approaches depending on on what's in front of you, I suppose. And, uh, and the reason I say that is because in my career, I've joined data teams that are at very different stages of maturity. I've joined teams that have been around for 30, 40, 50 years, and they're well-oiled machines. Um, but they can also be stuck in their ways as well, and they, and they may need a, a regeneration, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I've met teams who are, are pretty far along in their journey, um, and maybe they just need some guidance. Or I've met teams that are very, very early in their journey. Um, and if I sort of start there in terms of the, the very beginning, mm -hmm. right? I think where a, an organization often tries to start when it comes to data is we need people to analyze data. We, we need people to do something with data. Um, and it goes back to what I was saying around, are you sure that's what you want? What exactly are you asking here? Because that's mm -hmm. a very vague question. And quite often when you go into organizations where, uh, or parts of, of an organization where they need help with data, the data's normally a mess. Mm. 
costs normally a lot of support they need. And that's where I often start. And that's where Brompton started as well, very much from an engineering and architectural point of view. How do we get that data in a place that's clean, that's nice, that we can do, we can do something with it? Mm. Um, but that doesn't give stakeholders and people who, who hold the coin purse any, any value saying, right, this data's great, this data's clean, you've got it in a place where we can analyze it. What are you going to do with it? Mm. And normally where I would start with this is start with reporting. You know, if you think about what reporting was like pre-Power BI, um, and I've seen some platforms which I've, I've, I've not uh, enjoyed looking at particular reports on, I'm not going to name them, <laughs> but pre-Power BI, reporting was done very differently. You used to see a lot of reports in Excel as well. Yeah. Um, and I know there's a lot of people who... Um, have a lot of things to say about Excel in terms of what it can't do. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm a big fan. I'm a really big fan. And the reason I say that is, you know, and I know we'll talk about AI as well, is that quite often there's some really brilliant things that you can do in there that give you what you need uh, as opposed to boiling the ocean, which Absolutely. is when people yeah. go, let's do AI, let's do AI. There's some brilliant things in there. Now, I am not advocating for creating reports and dashboards in Excel. But quite often you do see reporting starting if it's in Power BI, powered by Excels. Yeah. And the way I describe it is the iceberg effect. Uh, and this is how I try to structure the way that I work with different parts of the business is that they would see a report, but all they would see what's going on is what's happening above the sea level. All the stuff that's happening to power that report is nothing to do with them. They don't need to know. If we need data from them, that's fine. But the way that that final number gets in that report or that plot or that piece of insight, it's nothing to do with them. We deal with that within our team. And quite often, before you start doing things like statistics and data science and AI and modeling, you don't want to be doing any of that stuff with Excel. So you can start with reporting. And that's really where I would begin. Um, okay. Just getting clean data, clean analytics out to an organization. Yeah. and. You need to be doing that concurrently while you're doing the data engineering and data architecture. It's not things that you that you sort of pass along the conveyor belt. These things yeah. all need to be happening at the same time. Yeah. I almost um, say it's similar to um, a clock and all the gears working at the same time. One gear powers another, but that gear is still moving. The next gear is moving and the next gear is moving. Yeah. It, Good it, analogy, it, yeah. it all needs to be moving at the same time. So. I, always, I would start with reporting, and once the data really starts flowing through from an engineering point of view, that's where I start thinking about statistics, that's where I start thinking about data science. But you also have to acknowledge that when you start looking at these more complex things, it requires a level of change management within the organization as well. There is a strong assumption that outside this room, everyone outside this room knows what data science is. Now, if we go out to the street and we ask 100 people what's data science, I guarantee you they'll say something related to biology or chemistry or, yeah. or actual science. They have, they have no idea what it is. Mm. And how many people truly know what AI and ML is? And I've still not found someone who can tell me the difference between AI and ML. I'm still waiting <laughs> for that person. All right, I'll have a think on that one. So I can do by the end of the episode. You can if you want to. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I still haven't found someone who can tell me the difference. I, I struggle to explain the difference as well. I, I watch some of the most senior people at the company, like the Googles and the Metas and Apples try and explain it and mm. it still doesn't sit quite right with me, right? So how how convinced are we that everyone knows what data science is? So mm. it's building that data team, but doing it in, con in concurrence with a, the way an organization grows yeah. in terms of its data maturity, data capability, um, love for data as well. It's yes. how do we get people not to see data as a as a roadblock, but as a catalyst to what they're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's how that's my approach. Yeah, I love that, and you know, it's a really pragmatic but holistic approach. And um, you're right, obviously, data science to a more or lesser degree, I suppose, has been born out of that sort of field of statistics, but. You know, it didn't really exist sort of 10 years ago and a lot of people sort of think they understand what it is but actually do they understand what it is a lot of companies I speak to are like <clears throat> we need a data science and ML team I'm like okay cool do you know why you need one of those and, and they're like well everyone's got one so we, we need one and, and then they hire a data scientists and sort of expect them to 
sprinkle a load of fairy dust over their data and and sort of see that value straight away but it's like you said very often a lot of companies you know it, it, it takes a good leader to make sure you get that plumbing piece right in the first instance you know data quality is where it needs to be and, and data engineering the pipelines and everything sort of operational there before you're even able to think about you know any kind of meaningful machine learning exactly uh, tools and that kind of thing and um but that that sort of approach of at least getting your ducks in a row getting the data quality where it needs to be but then also being able to start with a bit of low-hanging fruit around things like reporting which you know obviously is very visual in the business and it, it is something that people can derive that value from very quickly uh whilst you're sort of uh operating on maybe some of the more advanced stuff yeah i totally agree it makes a lot of sense um okay so i'd like to sort of delve a little bit further into because i, I 100 percent agree with you in, in so far as what i see is one of the, the great traits of a of a data leader I, I do feel is akin to a lot of the traits of what is a good leader in this day and age because you know tech and data it's the beating heart of, of most businesses these days right and um people that i think we've we've, we've had that where that divergence existed, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago between IT and the business and the IT guys or these techie guys that just didn't get, you know, would never be able to explain anything to, you know, mere mortals that work for the business that never understand it. You know, I, I really see that that translation piece, you know, being a diplomat, like you say, acting as the conduit between the data team or the tech team and uh, business, you know, non-technical stakeholders. I think that's such a key skill to have as, as a, a leader and, and 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 the most successful leaders in my opinion are the ones that really understand the value in that and, and really like say partnering with the business um around that so talk us through your approach to that how do you individually as, as the the leader of, of data within brompton how do you go about partnering and interacting um with just the business and and uh, you know technical and non-technical stakeholders alike yeah absolutely i, I think it's key here to note that the word partner means two and I often say this is that when we talk about partnering with different parts of the organization it requires the other side to do the same back yeah so if you're working as a partner not necessarily as a job title but you're partnering with and you know you're managing your stakeholders etc They've got to work back with you. Otherwise, it's not partnering. Mm. It's got to work both ways, right? And my initial approach and what I've been doing in the last two months is, and it's quite nice because my stakeholders are quite finite in this space versus being at GSK when it was just absolutely endless because of the size of the company, Mm. um, is that I've gone on what I would say is a data audit of the organization is trying to understand, first of all, at a very, very high level in, in each of the areas, what are they doing from a data point of view? What's the strategy? Where are you now and what are you trying to get to? What's the three things that you can't do right now that you think can be answered with data? It's as simple as that. And a big part of that is really understanding from a technical point of view, what are they doing in their areas as well? So as you can imagine, an organization like Brompton are buying a huge number of parts from a huge number of suppliers. They're putting a bike together and they're selling on their website, they're selling in their stores, they're selling to dis- distributors, to dealers, they're selling those bikes all across the world. I've just explained that in 10 seconds in a very, very simple way, mm. but there's a huge level of detail you know, below that. How do they plan how the factory workers work? What do they do when they get an order from on a website from a country that they've never sent an order to before, mm. right? How do they get an electrical bike from one country to another when there's legislations around what to do about the electrical park part of the bike? Mm. There's some very, very detailed things I there. Bet, right? yeah. So I'm very careful about how to, at the start, to what level do you understand things? Because mm. I remember having a conversation with an individual yesterday and I said, I know you explained this to me when I started, but my knowledge one week in this job is very different to my knowledge mm. two months in. So when you say the same thing to me now, I'm going to understand it a lot better. And when I ask you again in three months, <laughs> because I will ask you in three months, I will understand it even better then. <laughs> yeah. Because not everything's going to sink in the first time. So I al- yeah. always start from that point. Of, you know, What's going on in this organization? Um, what are the problems? What's working well as well? What do I not need to worry about? What do I not need to... Uh, 
stay up at night and worry about getting an email from someone around this particular thing not working, right? So mm. it becomes very, very clear very quickly where you need to focus your time. Um, and the way I work with these people is I make sure that they understand very well what's happening on our side as well. And the way I was thinking about this before today was about this podcast, right? So you're my stakeholder and I'm going to talk to you about this podcast and help you uh, make it reach more people, get more people to listen and get more people to watch it, right? Ultimately, that's what you want to do because you want people to hear the insights of the data leaders that you're speaking to on the podcast, right? Mm -hmm. But in order for you to do that, you need to understand on my side how the data is collected, how long we can keep the data for, how does the data come out of the platforms that you put the podcasts on into a place that you can analyze it mm. and what could you do from an analytical point of view to turn that into something that says to you hey you post this podcast at a particular time on a particular day with particular hashtags and particular keywords and these are the things that help you get this podcast reached further out right but you can't do that unless you understand a little bit about my world mm. i can't do that unless i understand a little bit about your world yeah so I'm your data partner, but you're my you're my podcast partner, yeah. right? Yeah. So that's how I'd go about it in terms mm. of creating those relationships, saying we can help you, but you need to help us by understanding some of the things that are happening in our world. Yeah, and everyone's a winner. Yeah, I love that. I, I, mean, I genuinely think that's a really profound and powerful statement that you know it stands to reason that a partnership takes two people. But I think that is very often misunderstood. You know, people talk about partnering. Really what they mean is, you need to do this for me. <laughs> you know, rather than actually we're entering in this things together. And exactly. um, I think that's a really, really powerful uh, way of looking at it, which yeah, I haven't actually heard explained like that before. But um, yeah, makes makes a lot of sense, absolutely. Um, okay, cool. Well, look, uh, we, we, we've spent quite a, a long time in this podcast already talking about data, and we haven't really talked a little bit about the differences between AI and machine learning, but haven't really necessarily spoken much about any of the AI use cases I was trying not to turn every podcast we do into an AI fest because it's obviously <laughs> very, very easy to do in the day and age that we live in. But I'm um, interested to understand from your point of view now, um, you know, having come into Brompton and sort of got more of a lay of the land now. And also, I think the point you made earlier about, you know, coming in and, and being a fresh set of eyes and, and really like just genuinely trying to fundamentally understand what's going on in the business. I see that as a really powerful thing because you're, you're kind of not you're taking sort of everything I suppose at, at face value having not necessarily got that previous inertia of you know well this is the way we do things here and you know you kind of bring that fresh lens to be able to challenge things in a in a positive way which I think is a really uh, great place to start from identifying some AI use cases um, so how have you gone about that process of sort of assessing use cases and, and indeed you know are there any that are sort of coming to mind that you're really excited about that you think would add a lot of value to the business moving forward? Yeah, it's worth being transparent here that we are very early in our data journey. Yeah. Um, what I would say is that um, I'm recruiting for quite a few roles in my team. And when I do see people who do talk about AI and ML, when I'm interviewing them, absolutely, it's making me think about, right, this person can come in and do the role that I'm recruiting for. But they're also coming in with this future thinking mindset about um, the art of the possible in the future as well. I think this whole debate around AI, most people are, are extremely excited about it. And I'm normally one of those people who um, get excited about things very, very, very quickly. But with AI, I've got a bit more of a conservative approach in terms of how and when we should be using it. Mm. And I, I mentioned earlier that I was going to name drop some of my colleagues uh, in my last role at GSK, but there was a lady in my team called Charlotte. She won't mind me talking about her. Um, but she did a lot of work around designed thinking. And I started doing this huge amount of research around how designed thinking was used to almost calm down some of that excitement around the new emerging technologies that were coming out, particularly around AI as mm. well. And once you really get the right people in the room, you realize there's some there's sometimes often quite simple and quick approaches that, that can give people what they need versus AI. And one of the things that I that I started thinking about what about AI was that AI in itself is an influencer. It 
it's something that people see and as a result of seeing it, they want to do it and they want to be part of it and they, and, and they want to buy into it. And I thought to myself, what else in the world is disguised as an influencer? I was thinking about it and I thought, the first thing that came to my mind was Taylor Swift. <laughs> right. Some people think she's a machine. What, well, <laughs> maybe Taylor could be AI. So she is a music artist. She's a fashionista. She, uh, women's rights, huge about women's rights as well. She um, is a dancer as well. Um, and all of those things are influencing. And I said to my CEO when I joined Brompton, I said, you want to talk about marketing? Just get Taylor Swift on a Brompton bike and you'll see what happens. Everyone will buy one. I do not think you realize how many fans she has. I, I read something that said during her tour in the UK, 1% of the population will go and see Taylor Swift in the UK. Crazy. And people go, oh, that's only 1%. Yet 1% of 66 million yeah. people, that's 660,000 people. That's mm. a lot. That's a small city in the UK. Yeah. That's I don't know, probably the size of Glasgow. I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing here, right? That's a lot of people. So more than anything, she's an influencer. People want to listen to her music. People relate to her music. People will follow her dances. People will do what she does. She is an influencer, but just on a huge scale and extremely multi-talented. And that's where I almost see AI. It's something that can be done on a huge scale. And, and it is multi-talented. It's able to do things that we just can't do, whether it's from generative AI to, to other types of AI. And so people jump on the bandwagon around AI, exactly to what I was saying earlier. Was that, oh, I, I've been told by someone that this is a really brilliant thing, so we should be doing AI. Now, ha now how do you take people away from that? Now, there is a, a link, obviously, between the way that the world has evolved from a technology point of view to have something like AI, and also from a technology point of view where we are so exposed to people's opinions through social media. Those two things are, are linked, right? That AI has come at a time in our life where we can be super exposed to other people's opinions and, and uh, get direction from the leaders of the world or get directions from the friends whose opinions we respect. So right now I'm in a, I'm in a place of being really, really calm about AI, but Funnily enough, I was um, I was in Brompton's Covent Garden store yesterday doing a, a shift as part of my induction. Oh, right, cool. And, um, so many bikes? Uh, no, unfortunately. Oh, <laughs> but they what? said only one person's ever come in and sold a bike from, from the head office. Anyway. Sounds like a challenge. It does sound like a challenge. I think I, I managed to convince someone to go online to buy a bike for his daughter. But this is the story about this guy who's from Singapore and his daughter was... Um, She's doing her, her PhD in in Boston, so I'm assuming at Harvard or something like that. And she's working on AI chips. And um, the professor that she's working with is um, studies battery science. So he, she, he was asking whether he could take the bike from the UK to America, which he can't. Uh, but he was just talking to me about AI. And he said to me, Doraj, if you don't get ahead of AI now, that's it. Everything's going to become AI. And it was the first time ever that I got a little bit scared about AI. But what was interesting was that it's this guy, I have no idea who he is. Right? I spoke to him for half an hour, but his opinion had such a big impact on me. And that's nothing to do with, you know, the, the tech era when I'm re oh, I don't have Twitter, but reading a tweet or seeing a news article on an app on my iPhone. It was a genuine in-person conversation at a shop a conversation that could have happened 20 years ago, of course, not about AI. And it, that has started to change the way I've been thinking about AI, just that one conversation. But it's, it's interesting how something I feel was quite authentic from someone who seemed extremely credible yeah. has had an impact on my thinking just yesterday. Interesting. Do you think, it just literally had a light bulb moment there whilst you were talking, do you think that's the answer to your question? What's the difference between AI and ML? That... AI, it's about its adoption globally that pe ev people have cottoned on to that concept of AI. Whereas, you know, you ask, like, say, Joe Boggs walking down the street, what's ML? They wouldn't, wouldn't know or really be able to proffer a guess. But AI is like, machine learning is like how it works, but AI is the thing. And it, it kind of 
carries with it a very emotional, emotionally charged connotations, doesn't it? Like I say, to all intents and purposes, it's kind of the same thing. I think so, yeah. I think but, you've hit, hit the nail on the head from a perception point of view. I think the bit that still people haven't explained to me is from a technical point of view, what yeah. does it mean? Mm. So, you know, if someone says we're doing AI and, and person X says we're doing AI and person Y says, no, we're doing ML, I would ask, based on what? Mm. But when you say we're doing ML, not AI, what do you mean? Is it based on the definition you've just said? Mm. That, or, is it, or is it based on something technical? And maybe I don't need the answer. Maybe I'll never get the answer. Maybe ML is just not a term anymore and we just stick with AI. Or sometimes I've even seen MI as well. I've seen the term machine intelligence. I saw jobs ad- advertising for uh, machine intelligence engineers. So, yeah, who knows? <laughs> So I think many MIB. <laughs> yeah, I mean that is uh, what I really like about the fact that you know having worked in, in technology recruitment for sixteen years this is the first time sort of the the rise of AI has really started to kind of raise these ethical conversations and sort of more esoteric, almost sort of philosophical conversations. And um, so I think it's such a an interesting sphere to be in at the moment, you know. But um, but yeah, I could talk about that for hours. But I guess to uh, to, to sort of keep on track and uh, and hear a little bit more about your your thoughts on things. A couple of last questions. Um, but I'd be keen to to hear your thoughts on. So when you're um, you, you talked a bit about how you're structuring the team, uh, data and technology obviously are very akin. But I think the data world has been a little bit behind the the, the world of pure play software engineering insofar as methodologies and kind of how. Um, data teams engage with the business. You know, probably that agile methodology hasn't necessarily been as impregnated into data functions, possibly as it has been in kind of, you know, scrum teams of software engineers and software developers and that kind of thing. But do you, as a data leader, employ any specific methodologies or approaches that you find helps you successfully execute uh, data projects? Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you mentioned the first one, agile. And what I would say is, In my experience, and I think any leader would back me up on this, what project, what data science, data reporting project have you seen been done in two weeks? None. And what project had the same requirement at the beginning that it did at the end? None. So if you can't manage the stakeholders expectations within a very short period of time, how are you going to get anything done? And quite often I see data teams extremely overwhelmed because in general what I've seen is that people who work in data environments aren't the sort of people who would approach stakeholders and say uh, and be able to say no for example they they don't feel comfortable saying no and I never say no I, I often say something along the lines of not yet um, which means I, I'm not going to do it now, but I'm going to come to what you're doing. But I, I think agile is extremely important. And what I've seen even more so for me is that it's helped me understand what the team are doing as well. Everything's written down. It's really, really clear. I can yeah. see how my team's progressing with exactly what they're doing, but also everyone else in the team can see what they're doing. And what we've started to identify with agile is the interdependencies between if person A is working on something, then person B can't start doing that. Or person A here, it, what's happened recently is uh, person A here is working on uh, material cost forecasting. So how do we track how much each of the, the materials, the components of the bike cost over time? And then based on that, how can someone else in another team in within my team use the costs that are coming from those materials as part of the work they're doing instead of instead of doing some of that more manually. So yeah. the data scientist and one of my data admin have all of a sudden found this way of working together because their worlds come together, which they would never know about if, if we weren't working in the way we were. And of course, mm. I've only been there for a couple of months, but I think within two or three weeks, we went straight into Agile and straight into Jira just to start tracking what the, what the team are doing. Nice. What I found really helpful uh, and what I've really appreciated, not just at my time in Brompton, but at, at my previous company as well, was that it really helps you to have conversations with the organization around, I'm doing this within this particular sprint. 
if you want me to work on what you're now asking me to work on within this sprint, something else has to go. Yeah. You can decide, but something else has to go. Mm. Or there's someone more senior and you say, hey, we're working on these three things, but someone has asked for this to come in mm. and they've got oversight of all of those things. If we're going to push one of them out, what would it be? Because right now the team are at X percent, X percent capacity and we can't do any more. Yeah. And it helps you have really, really clear and concise conversations with the organization. And the third thing that it really helps with is that I've noticed that when we work in two week sprints, my stakeholders often come to me at the start of my second week because they know if they want what they what they want done coming in within the next sprint, they know exactly to w when to talk to me. And I'll say to them, you can meet with me today, but if you meet with me next week, we would have started a new sprint and we won't even consider starting on that piece of work for another two weeks. And so they know how we work and they make time for me. And, mm. that's, and that's what I mean by partnership. Yeah. They're understanding how our team needs to work. They're getting involved. They're understanding that we're not going to get a project, sit in a dark corner for two months and deliver it because the goalposts move. It's mm. as simple as that. They always move. Mm. And what people ask for and what people get, uh, and what people ask for once the product's delivered are always two different things. Yeah. So yeah. that's, so that, that idea of agile, whatever you want to call it, sprint format, I, I believe in that. But again, it, this is not just related to data teams. I think all yeah. teams should be working in this sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're, you're using it in a way that that methodology seems to uh, encapture and align really well with those, um, you know, your ideology that you were talking about there with partnership, but also protecting your team at the same time as well, right? It's, it's that mutual respect thing of that we're going to do this for two weeks. But like say, if things do change, being able to push back to the business and say, cool, we're going to take that out, we're going to put this in, because very quickly, if you're you're not working in agile methodology, it can often be, uh, I think, quite easy to be overloaded, you know, with with, with different requirements and uh, and not be able to actually deliver on any of them. Whereas uh, that methodology, I can I can definitely understand, sort of would really yeah, encapsulate your um your your kind of approach as a leader. So yeah, makes a lot of sense. I, I've noticed that that sometimes ten percent of ten things get done, as opposed to seventy percent of three things, mm. because things become an and and not an all. Yeah, and. Agile moves you from and to or. We're not going to deliver anything if we start everything. We're going to deliver something if we pick and choose what we start, and we'll come to those later. The yeah. power of not yet. I, mm. I I love saying not yet to people, which means I want to do it, but I can't do it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Like that a lot. Cool. Well, look, we're going to draw to a close relatively soon, but there's one one uh, sort of topic I was keen to put your brains on because I know from our previous conversations it's uh, something you've got a very, a very deep passion for, and that's around the diversity and inclusion piece, which I think, again, certainly is not a, a data-specific concept, absolutely, and uh, something that uh, you know it should be on the agenda of every single company out there. Uh, but I do think it's certainly from a diversity perspective something that that is sort of plaguing the tech and data world um you know probably more so than other areas in all honesty so i think it's good to sort of pick the brains of people like yourself that have clearly been an advocate in this space and um you know done a lot of meaningful work in that so talk me through if you'd be so kind in your experience how do you feel a company can effectively build a, a diverse and inclusive um culture yeah, it's, it's one that I am very passionate about. And thanks for picking up on this. Um, when I was at GSK, I was leading our LGBTQ network. Um, and obviously, as a, as a person of colour as well, um, there's not many people who look like me who are out and proud and quite active, um, whether that's within uh, the tech industry or, or most companies. Um, and I remember very well that when I did join that leadership team, not leading it, there was a lady who came up to me. Um, I remember her so well, because I bumped into her on the weekend and I don't think she recognized me. What was that after five years? And she said, why have you joined the leadership team? And I said, because I remember it was, I was 26 and I said to her, because 10 years ago when I was 16, I wish I saw someone like me and I never ever saw someone like me. And it's that whole cliche of being the change that you want to see in the world. Yeah. And it can be exhausting because 
you you know for a long time you feel like that you always have to uh, lift your head above the parapet and I have often taken a step back like I have um, once I stepped down from from leading that network towards the end of my time at GSK because it, it takes a toll on the body not just the mind it takes a toll on the body absolutely I think what I've seen with organizations in terms of diversity and inclusion and equity is the the, the awful, awful issues um, publicly around with George Floyd and Sarah, Sarah Everett, particularly in this country. I think the, the, obviously the George Floyd impact was global. The Sarah, Sarah Everett impact, I don't know how, what impact that had globally, but it was huge in the UK, mm. huge in the UK. Yeah. And of course the Me Too movement meant that there was a huge drive towards change um, for people of colour and for women. And there's a, there's a few people who have come up to me and said, but you support the LGBTQ network. Of course, you don't feel included in this. And I said, hey, I'm a person of color. And I have this strange dichotomy where I have uh, one part of me, which is hugely visible a, a, as, a, as a, a diversity element, as what we talk as a typical diversity element. But I have another part of me that's not visual, that unless I say it, people may not necessarily know because we... We don't assume anyone's sexuality these days. And so I understand what it's like to be treated in a particular way because of the colour of my skin. But or, uh, And people won't say, you know, casual racist remarks in front of me or things that could be considered racist. But because it doesn't say my sexuality or my skin or my forehead, people won't say, people would say things in front of me, sorry. Um, because they don't know. I, I always ask myself, imagine if all of us, when we were born, our sexuality was written somewhere where everyone could see. Not saying that sexuality is prescribed for the rest of your life, but imagine if everyone could see it. The world would be very different mm. in the sense that point, yeah. so many people wouldn't be in the closet, but we'd be far more conscious around the way that we talk around, around people. And I mention this because I think what's happened from both of those external events is that organizations have found it very, I shouldn't say easy, I have found it easier to create programs and to create progression for visible diversity. And you have to remember that sexuality is not visible. Two thirds of disabilities are not visible as well. So we could go out on the street and see no one who's visibly disabled, but people, but mo but a lot of disabilities are. You can't see them, right? So there's an element of being able to hide that with people. And so when you're creating strategies and when you're trying to collect data about organisations and you're trying to target people to be part of particular things um, it's, e it's easier to do with people of color and with women because it's i'm not saying it's a hundred percent but it's easier to make an assumption about those things when you see people mm. um and, and that's a shame and, and what i realized when i was working for my previous organization and this is not specific to that organization i imagine it's the case in most organizations is that the work that I was doing from a person of, uh, the work that I could have done from a person of color point of view and driving the race agenda in the organization may have got more visibility than what I was doing from an LGBTQ point of view. Sure. Because quite frankly, before some of those external events happened, the LGBTQ agenda was number one. It was huge. It, it, the organization did a huge amount and it, it should be equal across all of them. But what happened as a result was that as resource went into race and into, uh, into gender, it went away from LGBTQ. And so it wasn't, oh, how do we get everything up to the level that LGBTQ is? Is that how do we rebalance what we have? Mm. And, and that was a shame. And, and I admit that it, it created a disconnect between me and, and the organization. Um, especially because I was recognized on the outstanding um, LGBTQ future list, a future leaders list, top 100 future leaders list, mm. um, only a month before and, and the organization didn't, it's not that they didn't support that, but I thought they would have made a bigger deal of that the way they did with some of the, some of the um, other lists as well. Mm. And, it was, and it was a big shame. 
And I, and I think what I would say is that remember that there's a lot of people in your organization who have diversity elements that you cannot see, you know. Yes. Not just because, of, not from just from an ability or an LGBTQ point of view, but you've got people out there who come from, you know, you, you've got single mothers, you've got single fathers out there. You've The, uh, the list goes on and on. You've got people yeah. who come from very, very poor backgrounds, right, who who come into the workplace and come to work for some of these really big companies because they have they need to get a good salary to support their family, yeah. right? There are people out there who are carers and, and you don't see these things. It's it's where I got the iceberg analogy from. That there's so many things about people that you don't see and you only really choose to see what people see. So it's yeah. just about remembering that when you are looking at inclusion and equity and diversity, there are a lot of things you can see, but there's some big, big groups of people like LGBTQ, like uh, ability, and now as well with the cost of living crisis, people who are living closer and closer to the poverty line, yeah. and, the, and those people are just not supported even in huge corporate organizations. Mm. But there is also a line in, in that, well, you know, how do we how do we support everyone? Everyone's diverse, everyone's different. I say, like, yeah, absolutely. And that begs the question, do we need these specific groups? If everyone is diverse and yeah. everyone's intersectional, what is the purpose of these groups? And we won't go into that now. Um, but there there is a there is ways that organizations from a general point of view can be more inclusive, create equity and create diversity in a way that doesn't feel like it's targeted to groups that it that it that is easier to do. Mm. And Brompton are very early in their journey and I, I do want to get involved and I will get more involved in that sense. And I think now I'm in a data leadership position, I will I will try and use my position a, as a place of leverage to make change not just at not just at Brompton, but hopefully ha, ha, have a ripple effect across the industry yeah. and other organizations as well. Yeah, fantastic. Great, great answer and some some really fantastic points there. Um, it's interesting. I spoke sort of the prelude to that question. I spoke about um, how the tech and data world, I feel, you know, is is uh, is plagued with a lack of um, diversity just historically. But in the conversations that I have with clients now, that you know, th they say that diversity is very front and center for them, and that they really want to do all they can to create these inclusive environments. Very often. What they're talking about is is the, the gender diversity split as a specific thing, and what they're saying to me often is we just want to get more women in the team, right? And I'm like, I totally understand that, and and you know that's your prerogative. It's just one aspect of diversity, <laughs> you know, one aspect of DNI, and, I, and um, yeah, the whole point of um, you know, what you raised there about so much of um, you know it's not visible and you know how much are you fighting for those or creating those kind of uh, environments where that does still feel inclusive even though it's something you can tell if it's a man or a woman or whatever so um yeah i think that's, that's a really powerful point and uh, and great that you know you're doing so much uh, so much good work around that and it's still very um, you know something you're, you're driven by today so uh, yeah fantastic well uh, look i uh, i like to end every podcast with the same question which um uh, is if you had to choose throughout your career, or it could be personal life, whatever it may be, what your favourite piece of advice that you've ever received um, that you would uh, you would live by and, and sort of pass on to your fellow human, uh, what would that be for you? It's a very good question. It's a tricky one. It's a doozy. It, it's a tricky one. I've had some pieces of advice that have been quite specific to me, but I think that the one piece of advice which I probably got quite recently and and it's really made me think was that people are watching you far less than you think <laughs> yeah. yeah very true yeah and the reason why i've i found that quite profound is because you know a lot of people who meet me um and and my friends and my family would say that i'm a very confident outgoing person you know i, I don't have an issue talking or being in a public space or, or meeting new people. But I say that because I, I say that that quote is really important is because I do have self-consciousness and, and I do worry about what other people think. And anyone who tells you 
but they don't care what people think are the people who care what people think the most. Mm. It's a complete deflection. Mm. But people are watching you far less than you think. So do whatever you want. People are not... They, they, they may be judging you, but, but they don't care. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes... Uh, a lot of the time, and I, 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 it's starting to become a bit of a generational, generational thing. I think more people are, are starting to think that what other people's opinions are on what they do and what they say and what they listen to and what they eat and what they drink, etc., 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 becomes uh, more and more apparent about the decisions they make. Back to my point around being an influencer right is that if you saw taylor swift on a brompton i need to get a brompton mm. don't get me wrong i'm still going to push for that because I, <laughs> I, I think it's a genius i would love idea. to see that please tell me when you've made that if happen. you ever see that I, I i need to get some sort of commission off that but um <laughs> yeah if you see taylor swift on a brompton you get a brompton you say well no you get the brompton and then you think oh i i've got this and everyone's gonna think i'm cool because i've got a brompton because taylor swift's got one People are not looking at you riding the Brompton. People are still looking at Taylor Swift. Mm. And next week, she'll be doing something else. She'll be in, uh, I don't know, a restaurant, a, a chain restaurant. And all of a sudden, that becomes the new thing because Taylor Swift's in, in a chain restaurant somewhere. I don't mm. know, making it up. And th and that's the new thing. Um, but people are not watching you. They're, yeah. they're not. Um, and the ego can find it hard to hear that, right? We Because we... We all, I think, deep down, often can have a, um, a self-inflated view of ourselves and the way the world sees us. But yeah. if we let a lot of that go, we start to free ourselves around what we do and, and the way we act. And I think my, uh, to wrap it up, my approach on data, data leadership has been an amalgamation of, of great leaders, but also it's been a, a push away of uh, some of the poor leadership I've seen, not just in the workplace, but also, you know, in our political world and, and other places as well. And I thought, how do I take all the ingredients of what I've seen, mix it with the ingredients that I have to make myself into into me? And mm. how, how do I lead authentically and, and not feel like as if I need to do it because it, because someone's watching me and I need to do it in a particular way? How do I do it like no one's watching? Mm. And, and that's and that's always going to be my approach. And if, and if an organisation or someone doesn't like it, someone else will. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Great, great point to end on there. And, and I think it's, it's such a powerful message that you're right. Obviously, we see the world through our own lens. So we stand to reason to think that everybody thinks that we're the most important thing since sliced bread. But like you said, and, it, and I think you can look at it through the lens of even if people, you know, you, you do misstep or people do something and, and, they, and they do judge you, they'll forget about it within a few days anyway. You know? And then, you know, we, we, we big things up, I think, way more in our own mind than they actually are. Okay. Um, so we need to give ourselves a bit of a break sometimes. And if we do unintentionally, uh, you know, make a fool of ourselves or whatever it may be, uh, realise that other people have got far more important things to worry about than uh, judging you for the rest of your day. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, look, uh, Dawaj, really, really, really enjoyed the uh, chat today. I think it's been a fantastic uh, uh, episode. And, um, yeah, thank you very much for coming in and taking the time to uh, to be with us. So uh, I wish you all the very best in your your future at Brompton. I'm sure you'll continue to go from strength to strength, judging by the conversation today. But, yeah, please do come back in again at some point soon. And uh, we'd love to have another chat with you and, uh, and, and hear about how you've been getting on. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. Bye for now. Bye.